In today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be trying to fix this TRS-80 Color Computer 2 that I bought spares or repair on eBay. So as I'm sure you know, Sep Tandy is the celebration of all things Tandy and Radio Shack that happens in the month of September and is brought to you by YouTubers far more popular than me. But imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so here is my contribution to Sep Tandy in October. So here we have our TRS-80 colour computer too. Very yellowed, a little bit grubby, uh, but not in terrible condition, at least on the face of it, apart from that. Unfortunately, I can't show you the eBay listing on this one. I bought it back in 2019, but I paid £26 plus £8 shipping, so a total of £34. I got carried away when I was bidding on this. I really didn't know anything about these computers at the time, and I failed to notice, first of all, that it has a US power lead on it. So this is a 120 volt NTSC machine. Maybe not too much of a problem. I, I got an adapter for this, and uh, most televisions now, if they take an RF signal at all, will take an NTSC or a PAL, or maybe even a CCAM as well. So I think we might be okay. Let's take a look at it. So what I didn't realize when I bought this, because I don't know very much about these machines, is that you can tell by the part number that this is a 16K machine with extended basic. And that's not a bad thing, because the extended basic, I would have had to have blown a ROM and maybe make a ROM adapter if I'd have wanted to do that to a machine that didn't have it. But the memory is fairly easy to upgrade on these, so I might be able to upgrade it to 64K if I can get it going. So let's take a look inside before we connect it up to any power supply and see if there's anything that looks like it might be troublesome. So looking inside here, I don't see anything too horrendous. There's one big cap, but it doesn't see any signs of leaking or anything like that. No bulging, that's looking good. Uh, so here we have the 6809E, I think that's the microprocessor. Next to it, the synchronous address multiplexer or SAM chip. I guess these are the two ROMs. One of those will be the extended basic ROM, video processor, and then presumably some kind of input output drivers and some other logic stuff as well. Reset switch, power switch. Uh, yeah, I, I think I might just connect this up to some power and, and see what happens. So here I have a 230 to 110 volt transformer. I'm going to use that to power our TRS-80 color. So we'll power it up. There's a buzz. I think that's from this transformer. An uh, on-off switch. And a reset. Okay, so that's encouraging. When you reset, there is a relay here and it does click. So on a TRS-80 color, you can control the cassette drive with a basic command and that enables you to determine whether or not the basic interpreter is running even before connecting it up to a monitor. So let's try that. So the command to do that is motor on and off. I think there's a space in it. So we'll try that and see if we can hear the relay click. Hmm, no. Yeah, nothing. So either the basic interpreter isn't running or the keyboard doesn't work. So I think the next step then is for us to connect this up to TV and see if we can tune it in. So unfortunately, there's no composite video out on this machine. And in fact, it's not easy to adapt it to give a composite out. On some computers, you can take connections off the board or maybe a little amplifier circuit will be adequate, but it's not the case with this. And I think there is a replacement for the modulator that you can get. Uh, but I don't have one of those, and I think to modify it's quite involved. So it's just going to be the good old RF lead. <laughs> oh, it looks like there might be something there. And sure enough, there is. There's a lot of noise on it, but there's something there. And it looks like uh, it's exactly what we'd expect to see. Extended color basic 1.1. 1 
copyright 1982 by Tandy under license from Microsoft. Fantastic. But that does tend to suggest that the keyboard isn't working. And that seems to be the case. Also, the image, though it's there, is very, very noisy. I wonder if fine-tuning the TV will improve that. Uh, no, not really. So instead I tried fine-tuning the RF modulator and I had a little bit more success with that. Now I know I should be using a plastic kind of trimming tool for this. I didn't have one that fitted so I had to use a metal screwdriver. I know that's going to affect the picture but that's what I had on hand and that's what I had to do. But ultimately the result wasn't that bad. So the display isn't great but it's passable and until we get a composite mod it's probably going to be fine. Now what I'm going to try and do in the meantime is get the keyboard working and I'm going to try and just connect individual pins together on the keyboard connector here to see if I can get something to simulate a key press and unfortunately I'm not seeing anything here. No. I'm not seeing anything on this keyboard. Now I think one of these chips, I want to say it's um, this one, 6822 is the main driver for the keyboard. So I'm going to check some voltages to that and maybe voltages along here. But probably the first thing to do, since this is socketed, is just to pull it out and pop it back in and see if it fixes the problem. Okay, so it's a bit tight, but it survived relatively unscathed. So I'm just going to spray down that connector with some uh, residue-free fast-drying contact cleaner, and then we'll pop the chip back in. Well, that didn't do it. So I'm quite lucky that the service manual for the TRS-80 Color Computer 2 is available online and has a section entitled No Keyboard Entry. So let's see what it has to say. No keyboard entry may be caused by a variety of factors. These include broken flex cable which connects keyboard to the main PCB. Well, I don't think it's that because if it was that, my simulation of the key presses would have resulted in some activity on the screen. Defective PIA U7. It could be that. Maybe we'll come back to that one in a minute. I don't have one to try it right now. 5 volt connection to the pull-up resistor pack. No. Defective RP1. Uh, that's the resistor pack. No. Short to ground on any of the keyboard row inputs? No. Or a defective keyboard? Well, again, uh, no, I don't think so, because if that was the case, then me connecting two wires together and simulating key presses directly on the connector would have resulted in keys being pressed and appearing on the display, and it didn't. I have two probes connected together, so there's continuity between these two, and when I simulate key presses as best I am able by connecting on the connector using these probes, essentially simulating a key press, I still don't see anything on the display. In particular, note that capacitors on the joystick fire leads C15 and C18 might short and cause this problem. So we'll check those too. No. Oh well, worth a go. So it's back to our old friend, the Tandy Service Manual. And according to it, PIAU7 is the only active component in the keyboard interface circuit. So let's take a look at that. So the part that I decided to try and replace the PIA with was a W65C21S6 TPG-14 from the Western Digital Center, Inc. I did this because at the time of filming, they were still available new as a drop-in substitute, I think for the MC6821, but given the similarities between the MC6821 and the MC6822, I thought probably I'd get away with it. And it was definitely cheaper and easier to get hold of than a new old stock MC6822. But it didn't make a difference. So I'm starting to doubt this 6821 compatible that I got. It could be faulty and I've got no way of testing it, unfortunately. Uh, and I also don't know for sure whether it's going to be compatible with the 6822 that it replaced. So the sensible thing for me to do is maybe order another 6821 just to really, really rule it out. And uh, 6822 as well, although those are really quite expensive. So before I go replacing this again though, there is one more thing that I'd like to try. It looks like this is enabled by a line that comes 
from another chip. So the 6822 has this PIA0 line, and that PIA0 line comes from uh, here, which is U174LS138, which is this chip here. Now, unfortunately, this does a lot of the addressing. It addresses the ROM and the RAM, and so I'm a little bit nervous about taking it out. Plus, it's in a delicate spot, and the tracks are really thin on this board, so I'm going to have to tread very carefully with this one. Really, I should wait until I can get another one of these, but it's Saturday night, I'm impatient, so I'm going to give it a go. So I have my desolder station running, but I'm actually going to start by putting solder onto some of these in hope of getting a kind of better thermal couple when I do come to desolder them. Well, I didn't do too bad. There's one pad that looks like it might have taken a bit of a hit there. Uh, I need to figure out where that goes and then I can just make sure that it is connected so that I can put a link on or something afterward if it's not. So I'm just going to solder an IC holder in there. If I can get it to sit in place. Then I'll then hold it in place with some blue tack and we'll solder it up. Okay, so that's there. It's gonna pop some blue tack on just to hold it in place while I solder it. And then uh, after that, we can take the blue tack off, of course. So I'm going to stall the old chip in this now, uh, just to make sure that it's working as it was before. And then if it does, we'll switch it out for a new one. But I don't want to introduce any more unknowns, given that I've just unsoldered and resoldered this connector here. Okay, so we've taken U11 out. The old part was a 74LS5138, and the new part is also a 74LS5138, except this one is in a plastic package. The old one was in a ceramic package. But we'll slot that in now, and hopefully it will work. Of course, the computer is powered off at the moment. Okay, well, it seems to have fitted in okay. Let's see what happens. So I'm really not sure where to go with this now. I still have my suspicions that this MC6822 is the problem. This replacement that I have is a drop-in replacement for the MC6821. I think the difference, I think the difference is only in the pull-up transistors or pull-up resistors. I can't guarantee that, but, I did manage to get a new old stock 6821. Still not the 6822 that this should be, but this is a drop-in replacement. This is a new old stock equivalent of the 6821. So I'm gonna try this instead. I'm not massively optimistic, but we'll see. Damn it. So looking at the circuit diagram again, the PIAs, peripheral interface adapters, are selected by this U11 chip, and we've already tried replacing that U11 chip. It didn't solve the problem. But U11 itself is selected by lines from the SAM controller, which is one of these. I'm not sure which one that one, I think. Via a... Uh, or gate, maybe a NOR gate, I think, and that is uh, this 74LS chip here, U10. So I'm going to try switching out U10. So as you can probably see, the desoldering of that part there, U10 did not go well. Uh, I lost a couple of tracks. It happens. I'm not very good at unsoldering things. I'm a little bit impatient too, and I think, honestly, with hindsight, I should have cut this part out and then desoldered each of the pins individually. I didn't do that. I attempted to save the part because it's just inconvenient for me to get a replacement, and that wasn't a good idea. So what I'm gonna have to do now is I'm gonna solder a socket in. I was always going to do that, and then any tracks that are broken, I'm just gonna make the links on the back of the board with some jumper wire. And what I've done is I've taken a look at the circuit diagram uh, this way, and I've looked where U10 goes. 
in this case, and I'll trace it back and I'll solve the links in there. Fortunately, a couple of the gates, there's four NOR gates in there, a couple of gates aren't used, so they just need to be tied to ground. So it's back to the service manual and let's move away from the sections on the keyboard and look at the section on the peripheral interface adapters. The functional configuration of the PIA is programmed by the CPU during the reset routine. Each of the peripheral data lines may be programmed to act as input or output and each of the four control lines may be programmed for each of the several control modes. So perhaps it's the keyboard driving PIA that isn't being programmed correctly at startup. So I suspect that the 6822 isn't being written to and read from correctly. And the way that that happens is that there are three chip select lines. Those chip select lines need to be at the correct levels, two high and one low. Then the chip can take control of the buses, start reading information from the data bus or writing information to it. Two of those are tied high and the second one is controlled by the addressing circuitry, which are these logic circuits that we looked at earlier. So we should see read-write activity on pin 21, the read-write pin of the 6822, when we see chip select activity on pin 23, which is the one chip select pin that is actually used to select the 6822, since the other chip select pins are already tied to the active state. So we're going to take a look at that on the oscilloscope. So we'll get the scope connected up to those pins. Read-write is pin 21. And chip select 2, which is active low, is pin 23. The other two chip select pins are active high and are tied high with a 5 volt supply elsewhere on the board. It's up to VoiceOver me to explain what you're looking at now because the real me failed to do so. The top line on the graph is the chip select line. This line is active low, so when the top line is low, that's the time when the chip is selected and can write to or read from the bus. And as we can see, it's mainly high. That is the time when the chip isn't selected. We can also see occasional activity on the yellow trace. This is the read-write pin. This pin is toggled depending on whether the microprocessor wants the 6822 to be reading the bus or writing to it. But it doesn't really matter whether the microprocessor wants to read or write from the chip if the chip isn't selected. And that's what we're seeing here. The chip select, for the most part, is not active. And so the read-write commands from the microprocessor are falling on deaf ears. So the read-write line here on the 6822, pin 21, then comes across on the other side of the diagram, read-write comes in here, and then uh, stops briefly at the 6883, which I think is the SAM chip, and then it goes on to the microprocessor. So the microprocessor is selecting read-write, and then presumably chip select appropriately to select either the SAM chip or the PIA, which are the only thing it seems to connect to. So maybe it's the 6809 that's defective, the microprocessor. Let's try switching out and see. So I borrowed a 6809E microprocessor from a Dragon 32 that I was also repairing, and you might have seen on the channel before, and I installed it in the Tandy Color Computer too. So with our new microprocessor in place, the behavior is quite different. Look at that on the scope. We see the top line, that is the chip select line, dropping low, and then a read operation, and then we see the chip select line going high, and we see the chip select line going low, and we get a write operation. So yeah, I think this is addressing that chip correctly now, and I don't think it was addressing it correctly before. Could this be the answer? Okay, so I may have been a bit interpretive with the scope work there. I'm not an expert in using an oscilloscope. I'm just a hobbyist and perhaps not a great one at that. But let's see what the end result is. Yes! Fantastic! So I have to admit that's a big surprise and the first time I've seen a non-functioning keyboard attributable to a microprocessor. But I did try the faulty processor from the Coco back in a Dragon 32 and it didn't work at all. So clearly it is the cause of the problem. Everything works just as it should. Brilliant. So you may have noticed that the TRS-80's case is no longer yellowed and that's because it was the subject of a different video 
that I filmed during the winter solstice earlier in the year, a low-light retro bright special. But now I think we're ready for a quick game. There's a yellow stripe down the side of the screen, but I can forgive it that because this is an NTSC game and my television isn't multi-standard. I'm lucky to get a picture at all. Unfortunately, the other thing I don't seem to be getting at all is any sound. It's not just in the game. It's exactly the same if I use the basic commands. If I type in a sound command, you can see that it stops to execute the command, but there's no sound coming out and you can see there the volume is turned, you know, to a good level. So there's more work to do yet on our TRS-80 colour, but it's not going to be in this episode. We'll be seeing it again in a few episodes' time for some more repairs and also some upgrades. But for now, that's about it for our Colour Computer 2. I hope you've enjoyed the video today and that if you have, you'll consider hitting subscribe. So until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair. And off we come with the lid.